Good evening, United Family. Welcome to our COVID conversation. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about vaccines, the COVID vaccines. And so hit share and like um, if you can. I would love for you to be able to, for you to go ahead and individuals that you know who are concerned about getting the COVID vaccine, tag their name so that they can see this, this uh, post. Um, share this as well. If you know someone who is um, hesitant, a little reluctant, again, tag them, share this, because we want to be able to get the message out about the COVID vaccine, the facts about the COVID vaccine. And so um, please go ahead and do that. I want to introduce myself because a lot of you do not know who I am. I am Dr. Dana Ray Dotson. I am one of the pastors at Life Changers Church and I am a medical physician. I am currently working at Crossing Healthcare in Decatur, Illinois, which is a federally qualified health center that provides uh, primary medical care to the medically underserved population. And so we're talking about OB care, um, maternal fetal, med well, OB care, family medicine, pediatrics. Um, I also do addiction medicine um, and we provide psychiatric services. I'm also the chief medical officer of this organization. Um, and we are providing COVID vaccine uh, for individuals as well as testing for individuals. And so I am so very happy to be able to be part of United's uh, conversation tonight about the COVID vaccine. Bishop G.E. Livingston is also my pastor, who is also our presiding prelate. And so I am so privileged that he would have the three of us on tonight. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and allow my panelists to also introduce themselves. And I'm going to begin with Overseer Dan Johnson. If you can please go ahead and introduce yourself, and then we're going to Overseer Kara Harris. Absolutely. Hey, Dr. Dana, how are you? <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm Dan Johnson, an overseer here in the United Covenant Churches of Christ. I live right here in the Chicago, the wonderful, wonderful God City, Chicago, Illinois. And um, I've served in ministry for 28 years. I've served in community um, service and um, activism for over 25 years and been doing business for over 25 years. And so um, I have led the charge in some of the communities here in Chicago and helping well over a thousand people get tested um, in what we were calling our Safe Families, Safe Communities initiative. And then now we are um, working with our uh, Cook County board president to help um, get some communities vaccinated. One community in particular has the highest um, positivity rate in the state of Illinois and have not had an opportunity to get vaccinated. And I was just received a text message from the school superintendent of that community that our efforts to get um, a thousand vaccines in that community um, has just been awarded. So I just received that. And so awesome. uh, That's awesome. this coming Friday, um, we will have uh, vaccinations available within that particular community as well. So there it is. Excellent. And Overseer Harris. Um, I'm Overseer Carol Harris. So I think my face has been around enough so everybody knows who I am. Um, I'm the Director of Pastoral Care um, here in Delaware at our local hospital. Um, I, oh gosh, I do so much. I'm the, the, the founder of the Vines Community Project. It's our county's um, coalition um, for how we address substance use disorders. Um, I'm the National Financial Sec Secretary in United. I'm also um, the director of the Board of Overseers. Um, geez. And as, as it pertains to COVID, <laughs> in my state, my city, and my county, I sit on several of the boards, the commissions, and the task force, the task force that address um, you know, how we're saturating our state, how we're making sure that we get our citizens um, vaccinated. One of the committees that I'm most proud to sit on is, um, of course, you know, there's so many minority commissions around at the at the moment, um, so that we can assure ensure um, equity as it pertains to um, vaccinations in the communities that are receiving um, the vaccine. So I'm really, really proud 
um, to be able to sit on on those um, commissions and actually to follow the leaders. One of the commissions that I actually sit on, which is what makes this so important tonight, um, is actually led by another um, pastor and she was assigned to that seat um, by our Lieutenant Governor. So it's really, really a powerful thing the way our states are using faith-based organizations and faith-based institutions right now to make sure we get the vaccines into our communities. So that's me in a nutshell. Excellent. And so part of the reason why we're doing this tonight um, is, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a member of Life Changers Church, which is um, located in Decatur, Illinois. And we have a large number of the African-American and Hispanic population in our communities who are not choosing to get vaccinated or who are taking that wait to see approach. Um, and there is nationwide a lot of hesitancy about getting the vaccine. And I do believe that a lot of it is because people don't know the facts about the vaccine. And so here tonight, we have three individuals who um, have been really working diligently to increase the vaccination rates in our communities. And so collectively tonight, we're gonna to have a conversation about the vaccines letting you know the facts about it, hopefully dispelling some of the myths and getting you to the point to where you feel comfortable enough to go ahead and make that decision and get that vaccine. Um, so tonight, the first thing I wanna start off with is talking about how, that, how the vaccines came about. As many of you know, there's three vaccines that is currently available. The first two, Pfizer and Moderna, have been available since December. Those two vaccines are messenger RNA vaccines. The other vaccine is a Johnson and Johnson vaccine and it's a one dose vaccine and it is a DNA vector vaccine. So first with the messenger RNA vaccines, that's the one that people have the most question and the most concerns about. It is again, it's a messenger RNA vaccine and what people are concerned about is the fact that it seems like it just popped up overnight. You know, how did this come about? I don't want to do something that is experimental. I want to do something that I know has been tried into and has been tested. So the use of the messenger RNA has actually been going on since the 1990s. And there has been a lot of studies that's been going on as far as how can we use messenger RNA in vaccines and, and immunotherapy and a lot of different ways in order to um, use it. And so... Um, when the SARS virus ended up um, having a pandemic at that time, with the SARS virus or epidemic at that time in the Middle East, there was a lot of studies that were done and a lot of work that went into using messenger RNA to develop vaccines at that point. And so up until recently, when we now have the pan current pandemic going on and um, the issues that's going on with it, were we able to end up getting more funding for the messenger RNA vaccines? As many of you know, unless you have money, unless you have a funding source, you can't get things done. And so, yes, we have the preliminary work that was done with the SARS virus back in the early 2000s. We now as a result of the current COVID vaccine has re have received a lot more funding to be able to, to get the current vaccines manufactured. So with that, when China ended up developing or finding out the DNA sequence to the COVID vaccine, they put it out so that all of the companies can end up using it um, and then developing the vaccine. The vaccine is not actually the COVID virus because a lot of people are under the misconception that they're actually getting the virus in order to get vaccinated. You're not getting that. Many of you have seen a picture of the vaccine. It is a circle and it has all these little spikes that are sticking off of it. What the vaccines are actually coding for are those spikes. Those spikes is what the virus use to be able to get into the human cells to then infect the human. And so what Pfizer and Moderna have done is use the messenger RNA sequence of the virus of, that, of just that the spike to then create the vaccine. So what that does when you get that first dose, doesn't matter which one, if it's the Pfizer or if it's the Moderna, 
when you get that first dose, what it says is, hey, this is this, I don't like this, this, this virus, I need to fight. And so your body then recognizes that this is something that we don't like. And then when you get that second dose, what it does is it says, oh, hey, we remember you, we don't like you, we need to fight and let's get the whole immune system going so that we can fight against it. That's what the, the messenger RNA virus is doing. And so there's a lot of people who feel like you get sick when you get the COVID vaccine. You're not getting sick. What you're actually experiencing is your immune system is remembering that spike and it's saying fight, 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 fight. And so your immune system is actually, it's a good response because your immune system is recognizing that spike and it's fighting against it. Now, what's the difference between the messenger RNA, which is the Pfizer and Moderna and the Johnson and Johnson? The Johnson and Johnson vaccine is actually a DNA virus and is put into the adenovirus or a vector virus, which is like the common code. And it says, and it recognizes that, hey, and it's for the same thing, it's for the spike. So it's for the part of the virus that's going inside the cell. And it's telling your body the same thing to fight the virus, fight off, fight off the virus so that you don't get sick. And so both, all three of the vaccines are not actually giving you the virus. It's just giving you the code to the spike so that the virus can get into your body and telling your body to fight against it. So now, when are you considered fully vaccinated? You're not considered fully vaccinated until you get both doses of the, of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, and that's two weeks after that second dose that you're considered fully vaccinated. When it comes to the, the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it's two weeks after that one dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that you're considered fully vaccinated. When you're fully vaccinated, you're then able to socialize with other individuals who are fully vaccinated. You can um, be in a, in a closed setting with them without your mask on with other individuals who are fully vaccinated. Um, you're also able to travel domestically and in some places internationally with when you are fully vaccinated. Um, and also you are able to socialize and again in other small settings. Um, and so those are some of the keys or the, the benefits to being vaccinated. But the one piece that I really want to hit hard on is the fact is that once you're fully vaccinated, the likelihood of you dying from COVID or the likelihood of you being hospitalized with COVID is diminished. And so that is the main reason why I'm going to strongly encourage people to get vaccinated because then... You don't have to worry about the, the likelihood of dying or being hospitalized or being gravely ill from COVID. Then it can be more similar to you know, flu-like symptoms or cold-like symptoms as far as your degree of illness if you should ever end up getting, kept receiving COVID. Um, and so Overseer Harris and Overseer Dan Johnson, both of you, have been vaccinated. And I wanna start off by celebrating, congratulating both of you on, on receiving the vaccine. Um, and so Overseer Harris, can you share with us why you chose to get vaccinated? Um, so one of, the, one of the main and primary reasons is gonna always be, you know, your family for your loved ones and those, those of you that I, that I was around. Um, and that's because of the setting that I work in every single day, right? So, you know, we're in healthcare, so we're in the environment with the disease every day. Um, as it pertains to pastoral care for a very, very long time, we were the only non-clinical visitors that our patients could see. So mm -hmm. we saw COVID patients daily. We were in rooms, we were, um, you know, partnering with them and their families to make sure that, you know, we got messages to people, that we cared for people. And then to leave the facility and know that I've been in that environment all day and now I'm going home to my son, right? Mm -hmm. right. Or now I'm going to the community to a meeting um, around colleagues and friends. Um, so that was, that was really, really um, looming for me. Um, the other thing is, you know, for my whole life I've had asthma. So I'm already compromised um, as, it became, as it pertains to, 
you know, like breathing and things like that. You know, I thank the Lord for deliverance, but I've had it so long um, that, you know, those things would always, um, that would pop into my mind too. And just to be honest with you, if I could just be blunt, COVID is not a nice disease at all. People don't always pass away comfortably in their sleep. And it was a lot to watch. It was a lot to watch. And, you know, honestly, you just, you see that and you just know that's not, that's not how you'd like to leave here. So. Mm -hmm. And I know in the United family, there have been quite a few pastors mm -hmm. and bishops who have passed uh, secondary mm -hmm. COVID. And so one of the things that we really, that we know about is, is that it's indiscriminatory. Meaning, doesn't that discriminate. You don't, mm -hmm. Right, it, it, you don't know who it's going to affect. Who's going to end up being deathly ill from it? Who's going to just have asymptomatic symptoms? Um, we know mm -hmm. that individuals who have comorbid morbid health conditions are more prone to having some of the negative um, outcomes. But it's still, it's it's like Russian roulette, um, as Bishop Livingston states. There are some individuals who are. 100% healthy, don't have any medical issues, and they end up dying from COVID. And so when you're dealing with an illness that is so indiscriminatory, then you have to come up with something like the vaccine so that you can protect, again, individuals um, in your community. Um, so mm -hmm. Overseer Dan Johnson, you also stated that you are vaccinated. What made you make the decision to get vaccinated? Well, one, I had COVID and, and I understood um, the impacts that it had on me. By the grace of God, I, um, I was able to live through it, um, still deal with Amen. some of the post-COVID stuff um, from a pulmonary perspective, um, breathing and different things of that nature. Um, but I know what it felt like to be isolated in the basement for 14 plus days, um, uncomfortable, one night, I thought, I thought, you know, Fred Sanford said, okay, this is the big one. I'm com coming to join you, Elizabeth. Um, I had one of those nights where I thought it was the big one. Mm -hmm. um, so that's number one. Number two, um, as anyone knows that my family is dear um, to my heart. And uh, my baby boy actually had it twice. Mm. And um, one of them, um, the first time it was believed that from a trip that I was traveling from that he may have gotten it from me. And so um, that alone was one of the reasons. Now, as an adult, I've never taken a flu shot. I've never been vaccinated as an adult um, with the flu shots. It wasn't something that I felt like I needed to do or, or wanted to do. But when, when they told me that the vaccine was coming, I said, give me two, two Pfizer's two Modernas and one Johnson and Johnson on the side. <laughs> <laughs> and vaccinate, of course, me, vaccinate me well. <laughs> and, of course, and of course, I know that they could not do that, um, but they, uh, I did take two Pfizer's and um, I could not wait to get it done um, for the sake of making certain that I minimize um, the risk of me being able to get it, but more importantly, making certain that I do not in infect or impact um, those that I love. As an essential worker, I didn't have the luxury of working behind a computer throughout the pandemic. Um, our, our company, we have over 24 employees that I had to interact with throughout um, the pandemic. Um, a lot of different things that we were doing in the community. So I just wanted to make certain that I positioned myself and my entire household um, to be safe. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, and that is the message that we want people to hear tonight is that you have to find out your reason why to get this vaccine. And for many people, it's because I care. I have people in my life that I care about and I don't want them to get ill. Or it's the fact that I've been isolated from, you know, individuals in my life it can be a grandparent or or, you know, grandchildren, and I don't want to be isolated from them any longer. And therefore, I'm choosing to get vaccinated so that I can have some sense of normalcy back. And we know there's going to be a long time before everything is back to 100% normal. Um, but being able to socialize with individuals, 
um, is very, very essential. And one of the things that we know that has taken place as a result of COVID is that mental health issues have significantly risen due to being physically isolated from individuals. Um, um, the, the devastation has had on people's finances um, and, and just the whole sense of loss. Um, we're going to get into talking about some, some urban um, legends as, as far as the, the vaccine. But first, I do want to deal with this sense of loss because we did already have um, one person comment, uh, Ms. McCoy, stating that, you know, she lost her husband as a result of the yep. COVID. Uh, he was actually the second person in our state. Okay. And, yeah. you know, so when we look at collectively the amount of loss that we have seen in our nation, I mean, I, besides the, the big influenza pandemic that took place, you know, in the early 1900s, I can't think of anything else that has caused such a collective loss for individuals worldwide. So Overseer Harris, as you work as a chaplain and you minister to people on a regular basis who's dealing with loss, what things do you say to them to help them through that, through that time? Um, you know, you know, this, the person, Ms. McCoy, who had just commented, she is still, you know, having some, 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 I mean, it, mm -hmm. the process is going to go on for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you minister um, to people in that situation? So, um, you know, I know Ms. McCoy very, very well in um, the situation that was attached to that. Um, and, and just the COVID experience in general, um, I want to piggy my, back my answer on for something that you offered up in that um, there's so many urban myths, as we call them, um, that's attached to COVID. Um, and it's attached to the disease itself as well as the vaccination process. Um, so I think my conversation has switched gears um, over the course of time. So now um, how I would have addressed it, you know, in the beginning, I've kind of shifted gears now. So now, you know, um, a lot of times I'll introduce the conversation by talking about the vaccination and talking about, you know, the opportunity to secure um, the health of your family and your friends and those people that you come in contact with. Um, as it pertains to the, to the grief process, you know, that's, that's a consistent conversation. I don't think that changes whether it's COVID, whether it's cancer, whether it's that, that process, that conversation is going to always look the same. The construct of it is going to always be the same. You know, you want to encourage, you know, the hope in those that remain. Um, you know, you want people to live inside of the strength of memories. Um, you know, it, it sounds morbid, um, I guess, for some, but I know, um, I, I hate to use her, but because she's commented and you brought her up, I know um, one of the things that has helped um, people like Miss McCoy is the conversation that I always have with our patients and of, you know, of the family members of loved ones that are passing away. And I always tell them the vessel is the only thing that doesn't go home with you. It's the only thing, th th this fleshly vessel everything else you still take home with you every memory every sound every you know every rhythm that you felt at the frequency of the person's voice and what it did for you you still take all of those things home um so i think you know um when we start talking about how we address the grief process that has come with COVID, i think we have to talk about um all of those things in addition to talking about that I think we have to be honest with the fact that people are not just grieving. Um, they are grieving through PTSD. This has been, this death in this season was not simply death, right? Even if they didn't die of COVID, it was traumatic death. Why? Because the things that we normally do, the, the ceremonial type things, the ritualistic things that we do to make death um, acceptable, we were not able to do to be in a room with your loved one holding their hand when they took their last breath, to be mm -hmm. able to hear the last sounds or the, to know the last words, for you to be the person that they gave their last instruction to, right? A lot of our families are receiving last instructions through nurses, doctors, chaplains, right? Because they, they could not be there to visit. So it's grieving through PTSD. So I think we have to also be honest that we're not just a, um, addressing grief, but we have to address now the trauma um, that comes with this process. Right, and so I wanna piggyback on something that you said. And so starting off the conversation with these individuals with what they can do now, 
Because one of the things is that people have felt they have they have felt a hopeless, system of helpless, mm-hmm. hopeless. Mm-hmm. They have lost control. Um, they have a lot of people have felt a lot more vulnerable now. Um, life feels fragile, honestly, mm-hmm. for a lot of people. I mean, even some of my patients have talked about that. They feel fragile. And so talking about what they do have control over. So they have control over the fact that they can get vaccinated Mm -hmm. and that they don't necessarily now have to die from from COVID because if I get vaccinated, you know, the likelihood of me dying or being or, or, or hospitalized from COVID is substantially decreased. And also the likelihood of me passing this on to someone else is also decreased. I won't be won't have to go through um, necessarily a loss from someone with, from COVID again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that, that, that we, we talk about what we can do and getting vaccinated is something that we all can do. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so let's go into this whole discussion about the urban legends, about these, the myths or some of these, the, the conspiracy theories that are going around that is preventing people from getting vaccinated because, I mean, we have to address it, we can't ignore it. Um, there's a lot of different things that's going on and, and I'm gonna, um, we wanna get to some of these comments that, that's here. Um, but um, Overseer, if you can talk about what are some of those things that you've heard and, and then Overseer, also um, Overseer Dan Johnson, because you're, again, you're out in the community, you're talking to people, you've worked with trying to get people vaccinated. So you've heard their reasonings, why they, they're taking a wait and see approach or why they're just not gonna do it at all. So let's talk about some of those things that you've heard. Well, I've heard I've heard a lot of stuff. I mean, uh, of course, um, what many may, made reference to is the Tuskegee exper- experiment, and they didn't want people experimenting on us. And what was really interesting um, about it is that prior to this COVID nineteen vaccination conversation, many people had no idea what the Tuskegee experiment was all about. Mm-hmm. And so, but, you know, they heard it on social media. They may have saw some, a clip on the news and they took ownership of it. Another, another myth was those individuals that had COVID would say, hey, I had COVID, so I don't need a vaccine. Um, and the truth of the matter is we know that um, there are many cases. I have one in my own home where you can get COVID twice. And the second time around was more aggressive than the first time. And so um, that's another, as we know, that's another myth because that even you can get COVID again. Another myth um, was simply that, oh, the the product came to the market too fast. Mm -hmm. So now we've become experts in judging how fast um, a vaccination to get to the market. And Mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is, um, you know, when the last time we looked at ibuprofen to find out what was the active ingredients before we bought it off the shelf to take, take a pain pill for our headache. So you have all of these different things that um, came up. Oh, I don't want them to kill me. Well, let's look, you know, the, the, the vaccine is designed to, to, to take Black people out. I've heard that. Yeah. But, so, let's, so let's address some of that. So, yeah, sure. let's go. so first about the whole, um, I've received COVID and so therefore I'm not going to get sick again. Um, so the natural immunity, so this is your body building the antibodies against the virus. It only lasts for 90 to 120 days doesn't last for very long. And in some individuals, they have actually been able to get COVID as you stated twice. And so, and and for some people, it, their immunity, their natural immunity doesn't even last that whole 90 to 120 days. And so, yes, you can get COVID again. Um, with, what the virus or the vaccine does is that it, it allows that immunity, your, your immune system, to rev up and to to create the memory cells to remember that vaccine. And so your immunity period lasts a lot longer. So that is another benefit from getting the vaccine. And right now they've said for for those who receive the Pfizer vaccine, it's the immunity now is lasting for for beyond six months. And so that is a good thing. Um, The other thing that you had brought up was that again how quickly it came to market and i think we've we've addressed that that the the uh, development of the messenger rna vaccine 
um, has been around for a while. It's just that the process got um, sped up when they get more funding for it. And the other piece as far as the DNA or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for the DNA vector vaccine, that's been around for a very long time. And so again, that myth, I think we have debunked. Um, and if I wish I had a big debunk sign that I could have thrown up there. Um, um, as far as the Tuskegee experiment, now most of the people who are getting vaccinated are Caucasians. 80% of Caucasians that so far has been vaccinated. Um, of those who have been vaccinated, 80% are Caucasian. Let me word it that way, because I didn't word it right the first way. So of those people who are vaccinated, 80% are Caucasian. Only about 7.7% of African Americans are fully vaccinated. And we are the group that is hardest hit. So this is not a Tuskegee experiment that is going on. <laughs> Um, um, if anything, it's a reverse. It's, it's, it's the fact that um, we're allowing our fear and our hesitancy and our distrust of government to keep us in a situation to where we are going to be negatively impacted. Because again, when we look at those individuals who ended up dying from COVID, a majority of those were African Americans and Hispanics. And so we need to then reevaluate um, that, that conspiracy theory about the Tuskegee experiment, because it is not, it's not a valid point in, in this situation. Mm -hmm. um, and again, what we're trying to do tonight is come from a point of education. We're not trying to come from a point of negativity. We want you to be well-educated so then you can make a decision about getting vaccinated. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that someone posted is which vaccine should you, should you get? Get one whichever one you, 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 you choose, whichever one you feel most comfortable with. Um, if you, you want the one time dose, hit it and get it and I'm done, then that's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, um, and so, so that is fine. I know the efficacy is around 75%, it's around the 70% um, and both Moderna and Pfizer around in the 90th percent. It doesn't matter if you know that you're less likely to get that second that second um, mm -hmm. dose, then go with the Johnson & Johnson. Just realize for both Moderna and Pfizer, you're not considered fully vaccinated until you get both doses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so Overseer Harris, you have heard some, some myths as well. What myths have you heard as far as the, the vaccine? So I piggyback with Overseer Johnson, exactly what he said is what you kind of hear. Um, you all know I, I can't help but being on these calls without, you know, taking things back biblically. Um, when we think about our communities and we think about receiving um, um, critical information accurately um, or even information that may not be good information, but we receive it back from competent sources, um, you can't help but consider Caleb and Joshua. Um, they, they went out of the community, they got information and they brought it back to a community who did not believe that, you know, there was a chance or that they could. My, my issue is, it's not what the people decided after they got the information. That's not the discussion. The discussion that I want to have is you had people who came back with competent information, mm -hmm. period, the end. Because as an individual, you own the right to make that ultimate decision for yourself. My issue is when we have people who don't come back or don't share competent, integral information. That's the issue that that's the issue that I think um, black and brown communities in particular are facing. I know in our community, you know, one of the task forces that I sit on is the task force for black and brown equity as it pertains to the COVID vaccine and how things are being distributed. And I know some tremendous work is going into the efforts of making sure that people know that, you know, we are saturating the area with availability and still people are not coming because we listen to the unintegral information that has saturated our community. And it really is more difficult to filter that stuff out than it is to get it in. So what I, I really, really wanna stop and pause and recommend here is the competent voices in our communities, 
the integral voices of our communities, the, the voices that are in our communities that people have come to rely on, to look for and to listen to. Um, I know in our community, we made it a point to take pictures when we went and got vaccinated. Like we took pictures of the needles in our arms so that people could see. Um, you know, one of the um, initiatives through our Lieutenant Governor's office was literally to release videos of, you know, some of our community leaders getting their vaccinations and saying why it is that we're being vaccinated. I think the community needs to see it. They need to hear the voices that they trust. Um, and I think they need to really, really start filtering through some of the more um, important information. I think it is dastardly for us to be able to say that we're at a seven, eight percent rate of vaccination when I think if you look at the rate of saturation, it, it, there's really no reason why we are not being vaccinated at a higher rate. Um, Overseer Johnson said something that I don't want us to glaze over. Um, he, he'll tell you his household is made pr primarily of his young people, his children, right? So when he says somebody in my house got COVID twice, what does that tell us immediately for those of us that know that construct? right? We have our children believing that they are invincible to this disease, that it will not touch them, that they cannot be affected or infected by it. So we have our children almost living recklessly, and they too are translating these inaccurate falsehoods throughout their own environment, right? So we really, really have to get the voices out. We have to get those examples out. We really just have to say, and I'm super, super proud of him for even saying his testimony, you know, he's very vocal about, you know, what took place, but so many of us who've gone through that COVID experience, they are not. We don't share the testimony. We don't share how difficult it was to go through that disease and to come out on the other side of it. We don't share the story of how hard it was to watch our loved ones go through that disease and what it felt like not being able to get to them, not knowing if they were going to live or die. Those are the stories that we need to start sharing so that we can break the, the momentum of these myths around um, the vaccination. Right. And so basically from what you're saying, the population that is not getting vaccinated are our young people. Um, um, most of the people who have been vaccinated now are, are the 50 plus. Yes, seniors. Yep. And, and we're not seeing it in those who are younger. And those are the individuals who are transmitting it so much more quickly and, and, and predominantly than, than the other population. Right. And the, so, you know, the Pfizer vaccine is currently available for everyone 16 and up. Moderna and Johnson and Johnson are for those 18 and up. And so I am strongly encouraging um, our young population to really educate themselves so that they can be a part of the solution. Um, um, because we do want to protect, again, all of our loved ones, and that only comes about by getting vaccinated. Um, um, so I need to put on my readers now. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think Overseer Johnson was about to say something a little while ago. I, I was just going to piggyback off what you said. As you know, um, the predominant population in my home are, are um, 18 and under. And the reality is my 17 year old and 18 year old um, to, through my strong encouragement, got both of them vaccinated and neither one of them wanted to. My 17 year old did not want to. My 18 year old, as you said, Dr. Dana said, hey, I got Johnson blood running in me. Even if I get it, I could overcome it. Um, this body won't get it. And I said, you're right. That body won't get it because that body's gonna get vaccinated. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and literally because he's 18, she's 17, it's their bodies, right? So we had to have another kind of conversation. And the conversation is, okay, if you feel you're okay, let's have a conversation about the fact that dad is an at-risk guy with hypertension, a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, I'm not gonna say I'm obese. I just got a hangover and I didn't drink last night. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but the reality of the situation is, you don't want to bring it into the home and to affect the family. Here's the other issue. The other issue is, I think we're making conscious decisions, back to Overseer Harris' point, of making decisions based on fear as opposed to facts. And not really putting ourselves in position to make conscious decisions based on facts. And I think part of the effort that we're doing here is not talking about, you got to get vaccinated, got to get vaccinated. But we're really talking about now health and health and wellness education. 
-hmm. and having that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. Because as you already stated, more people have, more black and brown people have died as a result of it. But look how many of us are getting vaccinated. And I think part of it is an education problem. The Bible talks about our people are destroyed, not because of the devil, but because of the lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. And so part of this, and which is why I love this platform, is that we have to become ambassadors in education, in education and dealing with the true implications of how this vaccine can contribute to the further decay of our community. We're already way behind when it comes to economic resources. The digital divide is getting, the gap is getting wider and wider when it comes to our community and our white um, counterparts. And now here we are with, we already suffer from a health perspective. And now we're, we're making, we're making mm -hmm. a conscious decision to create yet another disparity where we're on the short end of the stick of, of a pandemic by which we may have the ability to do something about if we make a decision to choose facts over fear. And you can't say you have faith if you're going to make a decision to listen to fear because God has not given us the spirit of fear. Right. And, and um, so one of the other things that people have been saying that has been fear provoked is that the vaccine is going to cause some, me to get sick, is going to cause, uh, may cause an autoimmune disease and all of that. And I will let you know that there has been no, no, no uh, studies that have confirmed that. That is not the case. The other thing that is stated is that it is going to cause me, cause if my children get it, that is going to stunt their growth. Again, there, are, there is no studies. There is, I can't even think any pathological or, or pathophysiological way where that is even possible that it's going to end up studying, stunting um, a child's growth by getting a vaccine. That is not the case. Um, um, the other thing that I have heard was talking about as, as far as, you know, it being the mark of the beast. And so I got two pastors on a call with me, mm -hmm. uh, two, two ministers, mm -hmm. two preachers. Um, um, and, and I want to let you guys deal with that whole, that whole piece about it being um, the mark of the beast. And again, we know that that is not the case. Um, um, what do you have to say for people who are stating that piece of the myth that's circulating? It was here, Johnson. He laughed, so I'm like, he's going for it. <laughs> hey, listen, you know, if, if, if we understand how life and death work and God, Jesus came that we might have life and that more abundantly, certainly when we look at globally how there's been over a half a million deaths and over 30 million na nationally, it's been over half a million deaths. And globally, I think it's somewhere around 2.7 million deaths. Um, we see that the COVID-19, if there was a mark of the beast, is the one that's doing the killing. And um, the idea is that the vaccination will bring a halt to it. Um, to play into it's the mark of the beast, I think it's a waste of our conversation time um, because it is just another conspir conspiracy theory that's not, not, not biblically grounded, is not rooted in the word of God. It's, there's no evidence to say that. But when we look at the impact of what the, vac uh, what the virus has done, um, I would say that we're under a plague and we need, um, we need some help. And I believe that through the vaccination process, um, we are getting some of the help when we look at how the numbers are declining as vaccines are increasing. And right. so I'll leave it there and I'll leave it to our theologian of, of the hour overseer Carol Harris um, to, to talk more biblically about the mark of the beast and how COVID. So, <laughs> we don't even need to go there because you, you summarized you it, it. Uh -huh. wonderfully. You summarized it wonderfully. This is not biblically, biblically based. Not and because biblical. of that, we don't even need to put a whole lot on it. Yeah. That summarized it perfectly. Mm -hmm. And so what we have, as you stated, as we started off this conversation with is a lot of people who are working with misinformation and who are, who are doing things based off fear. And so the primary thing that we wanted to accomplish tonight was to move people from that fear and from that lack of knowledge to now, I know that 
this the vaccine has you know this has not been rushed it is not a target against you know minority population um that the likelihood for me to die from COVID or being hospitalized is significantly diminished with getting the vaccine and therefore it is worth getting because I'm keeping myself safe and I'm keeping my loved ones safe. Um, so there is a question that was posted um, as stating that they received um, the shingles vaccine and that um, now they have to wait to receive the COVID, vac to the COVID vaccine. And the reason being is your, you want your immune system to be able to respond appropriately to build immunity for the COVID virus, which is why you have to wait that time period after receiving one vaccine before getting another one. And so um, um, it is deliberate and, and, and I encourage um, you to make sure that you continue um, to wait that time period before you get that COVID vaccine. Um, and then also after getting the COVID vaccine, you have to wait also before getting another, um, a, a, a different type of vaccine. Um, and really most of the people who are, who are being vaccinated, you're talking about the high school kids as far as um, possibly the Minatra um, vaccine. Um, and those who are a little older, you're talking about the pneumococcal influenza or, um, or, or the shingles vaccine. Uh, so you should not get all of those vaccines um, while you're getting the COVID vaccine. You need to wait. Um, I know we're, we're getting close on time, um, but I did want to, um, to talk to Overseer Dan Johnson about the fact that one population that is not getting vaccinated um, at the same rate as everyone else are males. So more females are getting vaccinated than males. Um, so what message would you have, um, Overseer Dan Johnson, to try to encourage more males um, to get vaccinated? I think it's the same message that I've been saying. Um, if you don't do it for yourself, um, do it for the ones that you love. Um, you're, you're right. I believe the statistic is 61% of all vaccinations have happened by women. And um, of course, the rest is men. But I think when you look at women in general, when it comes to self-care, when it comes to going to the doctor and all of those type of things, this statistic um, goes beyond vaccination. So what we see is a parallel of how men take care of themselves or, or lack thereof um, in general. And so men have this thing, I don't need to go to the doctor or I don't want to go to the doctor, I'll be okay. Um, where the women are saying, take your tail to the doctor and they're, and they're getting to the doctor. So I, I think the message for men today, it goes beyond even the vaccine, but says, hey, hey brothers, we have to take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, many of us spend time working. We're too busy to quote unquote, take care of ourselves. We're looking to accumulate wealth, but the first level of wealth is health. And so um, it, it makes no sense to be a provider from the grave because then you lose sight of the greatest provision that you can give. And that is the provision of presence as a, as a, as a leader, as a father, as a husband. Um, and I think that's what we have to look at, that as men, we have to lead from the front. And what we see is a community um, that is dying at staggering rates as a result of this vaccine, or not the lack thereof. And so let's lead from the front and let's, let's lead the charge in our homes and in our communities and say, hey, we're gonna get vaccinated. Not because we feel like we're gonna get sick, if that's your thing, but simply because we wanna make a stance for a safer family, a safer community, a safer city, and ultimately a safer country. That was wonderfully said. You were so eloquent in your statement. And, you know, and, and we need to hear more of that. Um, um, so to our, our black and brown brothers and sisters, we, we need you. We, we need you to educate yourselves, to um, um, move beyond the fear and get vaccinated so that we can um, 
we can continue to to love on our, you know, on each other. We can continue to to lead our families and our communities in the way that we that we are 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 supposed to. And so I really want to celebrate both um, Overseer Dan Johnson and Overseer Kara Harris for um, agreeing to come on tonight and for participating in tonight's conversation. This has been a very robust conversation. And I want to um, ask if there are any individuals who have any comments or any questions. Um, if you haven't posted it yet, go ahead and, and make that post. Um, but th this has been such a privilege to, to be able to talk to you guys on the United Covenant Church's um, uh, Facebook page to talk about the importance of giving, getting the COVID vaccine. Tonight, there is, tomorrow night, there is going to be a second conversation on the COVID vaccine. And uh, Bishop Fernlander is going to oversee that conversation. He has some individuals from Pfizer um, that are gonna be on the phone call as well as um, um, other government um, officials and um, other pastors. And so tomorrow's going to be part two. And so if you have any further questions um, about receiving the COVID vaccine or you want more information, please tune in tomorrow. And that is going to be at um, 7 p.m. Um, Central Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, um, time zone. And that um, promo piece is going to go up later tonight on that also. Um, so again, to Overseer Dan Johnson and Overseer Carol Harris, thank you so much for being a part of tonight's conversation. Do either of you have closing comments that you want to make um, to our audience tonight? I just want to encourage people to like look for somebody who has competency when having these discussions. Um, I want to encourage pastors and leaders. Um, Delaware is a small state, so we're a little bit more manageable in how we um, get information through our communities. Um, but call your government offices, ask them for updates. You know, the faith-based community right now, we really, really are the catalyst for getting a lot of information out. Make sure we educate ourselves. Make sure we tap into those city and state resources um, so that we can continue to pass information on um, to our citizens, not just our parishioners, because we, we have more of a responsibility. Our responsibility is beyond the walls of our church. So it's not just to our parishioners or our congregants. It is to the general community. Um, so just I, I just really, really want to encourage people. We have weekly calls where the, the faith-based community gets updates in Delaware weekly. Um, so we know what's happening beyond the state. Um, so we just, just want to encourage people to like make those connections, try to ask for those things to happen in your city or, you know, where you are. And if they're doable, you try to spearhead it, make sure that it's happening on a consistent basis. I, I would simply just echo the same sentiments. And I've talked to pastors and leaders that have stated that they were not getting vaccinated. And what I ask them to do is, is keep, even if they feel like they don't want to get vaccinated, they are leaders of people and people follow leadership. Mm -hmm. So at least um, give the information and allow it to be the people's choice right. and not influence it by your own, by your own um, lack of understanding, your own fears, um, your own prejudices. Um, take ownership of leadership. And when you take ownership of leadership, you understand that it's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's about those that you lead. And so lead by giving the information out so that our people will not be destroyed for the lack of knowledge, but they'll be able to make competent decisions because of information that you've given that is valid and that is factual. So again, thank you both for coming on tonight. And just my closing comments is, I want you to move from a place of knowledge, from um, a place of, of realizing that there is a realm of control that I have. And my control is I can get this vaccine so that I don't have to die from COVID, nor any of my other family or friends die from COVID. And I don't want to be hospitalized from COVID. And I can control that by receiving the vaccine. I can get back out and, and be with other fully vaccinated people and socialize if I get this vaccine. And so again, there's 
three different vaccines, Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. Moderna and Pfizer are two vaccines you considered fully vaccinated after you receive both doses. With Johnson & Johnson, you're fully vaccinated two weeks after that one dose. And so please go to your local health department website, go to the CDC website, um, educate yourself, find out how you can get the vaccine um, um, and, and get it as soon as you have the ability. Um, so to everyone tonight, all of my United Covenant Churches of Family um, that are listening, um, get the vaccine. Thank you for tuning in. And again, thank you to Bishop, our presiding Bishop, Bishop Livingston for allowing us to have this conversation. Be blessed everyone.